Um, since all needs for introduction, I will talk about how we met. Um, I was in UCCIT over the summer um, because my daughter was doing an internship there and she was too young to go by herself. And uh, my advisor, Pradeep, uh, who is the chancellor there, uh, one of my teachers, um, he sent me a mail to meet uh, one of his uh, uh, team members, Ramesh. And when Ramesh talked to me and saw what we were interested in, we as in many of us in Bangalore, he said, you should talk to Don. And, and I looked up Don, and Don does design. I wonder what Ramesh wants me to talk to Don about. And we talked, and then we met again, and then we talked, and we met again. And four meetings later, uh, we realized that we have a common mission of using technology and design and other disciplines to help transform the world. Um, and uh, God, of course, has done much more than people like me. And uh, both as a mentor, um, and in, in his own inevitable ways, he said, I want to come to Bangalore to love, which is very humbling for him to say that. But with that, I will hand it over to God. As uh, Lala just said, uh, Pradeep Kosha, who is the president or chancellor of my university, he's the person who brought me back to the university. Because I started at the University of California, San Diego, in 1966. I was a faculty member before any student had graduated. I retired from the university in 1993. Well, I retired before a number of you were born. And, uh, and in my retirement, I went to Apple and became a vice president. And then I did a bunch of other things. Some of you know the Nielsen Loan Group company, I'm sorry. And I found myself at following a startup in Chicago, and it collapsed. And so I was there teaching at Northwestern in computer science. But I started a design group there at the Institute of uh, Design Institute. And I retired from Northwestern, <clears throat> my second retirement. And I was then living in Palo Alto, California, the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, I was very busy, I was on company boards, I did not need a job, I did not want a job. But Pradeep came to my home. He traveled what, roughly a thousand kilometers north to come to my home and say, please come back to UC San Diego. And he wanted me to start a design group. And I explained that I didn't want a job. And he's, he convinced me. <clears throat> but he's, here's what he said that convinced me. You can do anything you want with two conditions. First, it has to be important. Second, it has to be exciting. So how could I resist? So I'm back in San Diego. The part of San Diego is called La Jolla. Beautiful place to live. So what am I going to do that's important and exciting? Well, look at design. Designers produce things like this. Designers produce beautiful objects. There was a designer a number of years ago, Victor Papinok. I see one or two heads now, so some designers have heard of him. <clears throat> and about 30 to 40 years ago, he said, there is no profession more evil than design. Because what it does is it produces little trinkets that, yeah, are kind of nice to have, but that are not good for the world. So, why do we make these kinds of phones? This one costs a thousand dollars. The iPhone costs a thousand five hundred dollars. You know, costs about a hundred thousand rupees. And it destroys the environment when we make it because it requires some rare materials, and it only lasts about two or three years, and then we throw it away. Uh, in Amrabad, there's a big mountain of trash, 
that's also poisonous, and it burns, and it burns every night. I was so it's very beautiful at night, and poisonous. And there are the equivalent trash piles here. Why are we doing that? Why are we making things that flow that we throw away? Why do we need a better and better and better and better and better phone every year? But the difference is not that great. Are smartphones useful? Are they valuable? Is it wonderful that we all have them? Yes. But why do we have to buy a new one all the time? Why are they so expensive? So what can we do that changes the nature of design? We decided that we wanted to study complex problems, social problems, complex social technical systems, which is another way of explaining what I mean is the real world. We want to look at problems in the real world that we that work in. And actually, there's a really nice list of them, because the United Nations has put together a list of 17 most important sustainability problems. And many of them are much more than sustainability, because they include things like hunger, and education, and health care. Just take those as simple problems to look at. And of course, those are all very, very complex problems. And by the way, as far as I can tell, <coughs> Hunger and food uh, is not handled any perfectly any place in the world. Education is done badly all over the world. Every country I've ever visited tells me how bad their educational system is. And they point to some other country where it's done better. And then when I go to that other country, they tell me how bad their educational system is. And they point to some other country where it's done better. And so on and so forth. And healthcare is a problem throughout the world, and actually worse than healthcare is public health. Because we are actually willing to spend a lot of money and a lot of effort to cure people's diseases and problems once they have it. But we're unwilling to spend even a tiny amount of that money to prevent having the disease in the first place, which is what public health is about. It's the same with infrastructure, by the way. Uh, it's easy relatively easy to get a lot of money to build a new bridge or to build a highway. And it's almost impossible to get any money to maintain it, to keep it safe over the next 10 or 20 years, or 30 or 40 or 50. So those are the problems you want to work on. There are, and I'll give you an example, actually. In the United States, the United the National Cancer Institute, uh, which is a government organization, uh, and the Federal Communications Commission, which is a government organization, has asked us to work on problems of cancer in the eastern part of the United States. It's called the Appalachian Mountains. It's a mountain range that runs north and south along the eastern edge of, of the country. Uh, and in that mountain range, uh, there are very narrow roads. People live in isolated little communities. They have maybe 10 to 20 families in the community. Uh, and there's a very narrow road, just one car can go at a time, uh, that connects to a, the next to a town. And so they're actually quite far away in time from good health care. Good health care is maybe 300 kilometers away, but it could easily be three or four hours. And in the winter, it snows, and they, they can't travel. They're stuck. Well, this part of the country, yes, the National Cancer Institute said, had the highest amount of lung cancer than any other spot in the United States. They also have the highest amount of heart disease and of diabetes. Um, the Federal Communications Commission said, oh, they also have some of the lowest availability of high speed internet. And so the FCC said, Oh, if we can provide good, high-quality internet, then, of course, we could do telemedicine, remote medicine. We could even give them sensors somewhere so we could be monitoring their condition. So anyway, they launched a big project uh, which involved two major agencies and University of Kentucky Cancer Center and University of California San Diego Design Lab and a uh, pharmaceutical company, Amgen, and a whole bunch of other players. 
But they have seen things as I speak it today. You know, <clears throat> in the United, there's a famous journalist in the United States many years ago, he's dead now, who said, every complex problem has a simple solution. It's neat, it's elegant, and it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> These complex problems don't have simple solutions. So let me tell you about complex problems. <coughs> First of all, you look at Appalachia, uh, the people are isolated. Uh, and they live there all their lives and their families' lives and their families' lives. So in the United States, people travel a lot, families are broken apart, children leave and go someplace else, and their children leave and go someplace else. So soon the family is all across the country. In Appalachia, this is not very common. People tend to live there for generations. Second, there's no employment. They used to be the coal mine. The biggest employer was coal mine, but coal is a pollution. So we try to reduce the number of places that burn coal and use coal. And so actually, there's no more coal mine. And so they don't have jobs. So you're isolated, you're not well educated, you don't have a job, what do you do? Well, Kentucky is famous for its bourbon whiskey. And also moonshine. Moonshine is whiskey you make yourself. And so they drink a lot, they smoke a lot, they sit around and don't get much exercise, and they eat badly. They eat at McDonald's, they eat fast food. So they're fat. It's not a health problem. It's not an internet problem. It's a very complex problem. It is a health problem. It is a lack of internet problem. It's a lack of jobs problem. It's an economic problem. It's a lack of transportation and roads problem. It's all of these. And to solve these is a very complex problem. And it may take a long time. And we may not solve it, but maybe we can make it better. But that's the kind of problem that we like to work on. We only like to work on the ones that are really difficult. <laughs> if it were to a call, it wouldn't be a problem to be solved. So that's an example. So how do people normally approach it? Well, here's what the United Nations aid groups do, or uh, foundation aid groups do, uh, or the Bill Gates Foundation does. Oh, there's no problem. Let's find the world's best experts and have them look at it and make a recommendation. And this has been going on now for 10, 20, 30 years. We bring in the world's experts, we look, we study it, we understand it, and then make a suggestion. And the suggestion, well, these are usually big problems. So the suggestion will cost 10 or 20 billion dollars in 10, 10 years or more. And usually what happens is, it, and whatever amount they say it will cost, like 10 million dollars, it ends up costing 20 or 30. The amount of time they say it will take, like 10 years, it ends up taking 15 or 20, but worse, most of the time, it completely fails. So why does it fail? Well, actually, it has succeeded in one way. There is now a big industry of people who write books about why it's failed. <laughs> <laughs> and they're reality books. Uh, the book I like best is called the tyranny of experts. So here's the problem with experts. Experts know too much. And when you are an expert in a subject, when you're taught in the university, most of the experts in university professors are used to be, <coughs> you, you, you taught to generalize your knowledge because that's the way you can take general knowledge and apply it to many different situations. And so they give the general solution and say, this is what you must do. And this is true in all fields, like in, in, when there's a financial crisis in a country, the world bank sends people. They give very sensible economic advice that will destroy the lives of many people. Because the experts don't understand the culture, don't understand the people and the environment and the resources in this world. So 
How can we use the expert advice of a tailor to the local conditions? Well, there are. Where's your statue? So, in every community, there are really clever and creative people. No matter where you are, you can find somebody. So, what we are saying is, if there's a problem, what we'd like to do, like in Appalachia or hunger someplace, or if you go and look, you will often find that there's some clever people who have figured out things that make things better. And they understand their own culture, and they understand their skill level, and so on. And so the question is, um, how can we take advantage of that? How can we take advantage of the local community, community-driven work, and the experts together? So actually, I thought I would show you this, because One of the things I've been doing when I've been here is I'm trying to understand India. Now, I'm here a week, and there's no way I wouldn't understand India in a week. Now, even experts, sometimes experts say, I gotta understand local cultures so I'll ask them a month, or maybe a year. For a year is a week. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this because it's an exquisite statue. And it's really very beautiful and very clever. It's made of paper, folded paper. And it was made by a man who watched YouTube. He learned how to do this from YouTube, watching many, many things. And what it does is it shows, again, the great creativity we can find if you go around and look at it. And um, we can build on that. So this is artistic, but you can also find people who build water pumps in places where there is no water, and who build screening systems or maybe where there's a lot of malaria and they have to keep, keep the insects away, or or this or that or the other. And so this is this is a clearly expertise, but it's not quite enough. So here's what we want to do. And I haven't yet told you why we should do it, why these writers should do it. I'll we'll come to that at the end. <clears throat> so we have expert knowledge. It's basically top-down knowledge coming down. And we have the community-driven innovation, which is basically bottom-up knowledge going up. And we want to combine them. Except large projects tend to fail. So how do we deal with that one? Well, there's, there is a way to think. And now I'm going to tell you why I say we think. But I'm going to tell you what we think the issues are, and how we are approaching it, and why we think this is a very sensible approach. But we may be wrong. And so we're carefully designing our approach that to discover that if we're wrong, to discover that as quickly as we can, and modify and learn from our attempts. Because these very large problems have never really been solved, and therefore there's no guidelines. We know what fails, we don't know what succeeds. But there was a very important paper published in a journal of political science, oh, yeah, 30 or 40 years ago. And it was written by a uh, person who's now quite well known, but he was young at that time. And he wanted to make a paper that said, in these big problems, what we really need to do is be very slow. We should try to solve them incrementally, a little bit at a time, a little bit here and a little bit there. And he wrote a paper called Incremental Solutions, it said. And um, the argument, though, was that, which one do you choose? So he said, what you should do with a big important problem is analyze it very carefully. So you think you know what the solution is. So you know what the target is. But don't say this is what we're going to do. Because if you do, it's a very big problem, very big, very expensive. It's going to impact a large number of people. It'll help a lot of people, but it may harm a lot of people. 
And therefore, the people who are harmed will complain, and correctly so. And that will become a political issue, and it will be a big political fight, and it will be very difficult to get support from it. And then, even if you do get support, as you go through, it's going to take a long time, and you will probably have some failures along the way. And then when you have a failure, the, the newspapers will say, look, look, they're wasting our money. Look how much money they want to spend, and here's all many of part that has failed. It becomes a big political fight. So we say, you want to analyze it, know where you want to go, but then wait. Wait when some opportunity says, oh, how about trying it here? Just a little thing here. So you can do a little step here and you just make sure it's in the right direction. And a little step is more apt to, fit, to succeed because it's little. Uh, people don't get upset and get mad at you because it's little. If it doesn't succeed, it's not a big deal because it's little. If it does succeed, it helps you get the next step. And so you keep taking these small steps when the opportunity arises until you get better and better and better. And the other advantage of doing it this way is that, you know, in a 10 year period or even longer, the world changes, technologies change, the problem you're trying to address changes. In this way, you can be very flexible and change what you're doing. Or if you think you have the wrong approach, you discover it quickly and you can go back and try to modify it. So the journal editor when he published the paper, he decided he didn't like the title. And so instead of incremental improvements, etc., he called it muddling through. Uh, muddling is means it kind of means you don't know what you're doing, you sort of do this, and oh it works. So, okay, I'll do this, oh it didn't work, no, I'll do that, yeah, it works, and so on. So it's a bit better, more systematic than that. But the name turned out to be a really wonderful thing for all those who <clears throat> would do projects. You should learn some basic marketing skills because the name Muddling Through made that one of the most popular papers ever published, that the most popular paper ever published in that journal. Um, and it's what we say we do, we muddle through. Okay, now how do we do that? Well, what we're doing in Appalachia is we're working with the local community workers. The first thing we did was we hired Amber Bollers, uh, and she went off and she spent several months touring uh, Appalachia, becoming friends with many people, uh, and came back and gave us a nice story about what it's like to live there, and one of the important points were where we could find community people who were innovators. And so she found a small company that actually was big in the internet. She found uh, community health worker groups, and she also found that a lot of a lot of social workers are in churches, and that therefore we should talk to people in the churches because that's where the community bonded. And each church, there was an incredible number of churches in that area, and each church maybe only serves forty or fifty people, but they're bonding together as a family group, if you will. And so those are powerful points to work. With. So, here's what we want to do. And here's, what is the role of designer? Why do we need designers? Well, design is a field of application. The role of a designer is to do something that has an impact upon society, a positive impact on society. And designers traditionally are actually trained as craftspeople. So you make beautiful objects, you spend four years learning how to draw, and you may spend a year to make it. How many weeks in design school you spend learning to straight lines? Yeah, remember that? That's called one two dimensional drawing, and that's one dimensional drawing. Then you learn to do squares and circles. You spend a long time doing that, that's two dimensional drawing. And then you learn to do cubes and things, that's three dimensional drawing. And it's incredible how much time you spend. You couldn't believe it. And I'm sure the designers of the crowd who were smiling <laughs> couldn't believe that's how much longer it was supposed to use straight lines. It isn't just once, it's hour and hour and hour and hour. And, and the same with all the other skills. And the reason being, if you ever watch a designer at work, 
a really good trick to have. <laughs> so if you like, we use theater. So what we did is we went to the upholstery store. And we bought upholstery that was exactly the same as the upholstery that covered the seats of the car. And then we made a suit. We called it a seat suit. And so the one reason I would love to have use my slides now is to show you a picture. But uh, I can put it on me. And I, I, it's woven. So I can see through the little openings. And uh, I have to steer with my hands. So I have a little opening here and here. So you can't see my hands. And then I sit in the car. <coughs> and people look at the car and they don't see a driver. And if you look really carefully, you can see the driver's seat is thicker than the passenger seat. But it's actually really hard to tell, but nobody's ever noticed. So we drive that around and we try to understand people's reactions and look at a lot of really valuable data. Well, we can do that with almost anything. We can make believe that we have a working solution and see whether that takes us in the right direction before we spend a lot of money and waste of money. So we're always iterating, always testing, and as I said before, even when we do the opportunistic model step over here, we may do the whole step and then discover it's working. There is a relatively small step compared to the problem. And usually when, instead of saying it's wrong, what we want to say is that we've learned a lot from doing it. But I like to say that scientists never fail. Scientists doesn't say I fail. Scientists says, I spent a year on that and it didn't work. But let me try a different thing. And that's how we want to view it. Okay, so the role of the the role of the designer is to bring these people together and to employ these four basic principles and but to work with the community. We should, we believe firmly that we should not design the solutions because the solution has to be accepted by the community. So what we want to do is find those wonderful creative people, like people who did that, uh, people who have done things that are relevant to the problem we're facing, and help them, give them platforms, give them tools where necessary, give them advice and instruction, and then help them uh, disperse their knowledge, using their open source platforms so others uh, can discover what they've done and make use of it and perhaps modify it for their own particular use. One of the things we want to build on is a wonderful platform called YouTube. Because what is the most important and powerful educational medium today? I believe it's YouTube. Almost any topic you're interested in, you can find a YouTube that instructs you either how to understand it or how to build just like learning how to build that through YouTube. You know, one of the problems of YouTube is there's too much. When you look for something, you'll find 20 or 40 or 50 or 100. So I really love that Indian dish I ate, and I'd like to make it myself. So I look for a video, and I see so many of them I get confused. So what it needs is curation. It needs people to say, this is the best one for this purpose. But if you want to curate and divide things up into things that are most effective, why not let people do that? It doesn't have to be done by a group of experts. We can let the people do that. We can, in fact, build this whole thing with the power of volunteers and people. And there are examples. Wikipedia is a really good example. Wikipedia, the Khan Academy, there are lots of really good examples of citizen-based knowledge systems. And so, that's one direction we're going to Now, another direction and a problem that we face is, again, back to large problems. Large problems are really difficult to understand. And in part, it's because, well, um, the human mind is really good at understanding cause and effect. So, I have this is a flashlight. I have a flashlight, if I let go of it, it's going to fall and hit the ground, and maybe it would break. So, I'm not going to do it. You all can understand that. I'm going to give you a lecture on you know, Newtonian physics, etc. <clears throat> but what if there's a feedback loop? 
a thermostat in the room is a good example of a feedback. Uh, it keeps the temperature at a constant level. If the temperature gets too high, it turns on an air conditioner. If it's too low, it turns on a heater. Um, but it has a problem. It takes a while before it, gets, it takes effect. So suppose that it's a really hot day, and you come home, and it's very hot inside the house. So you turn on the air conditioner, but it's really hot. So you turn it to a low temperature. And then you wait, and 10 minutes later, it's still really hot. So you turn it to a lower temperature. <coughs> and another 10 minutes later, it's still too hot. So you turn it to a lower temperature. And then at some point, it gets really, really cold. And there are two things wrong with the system. First of all, turning it to a lower temperature than you want does not make it faster. <laughs> but a lot of people think it does. They think it'll get there faster and it'll turn it off when it's the right temperature. And second of all, it can take, cool <coughs> down a house, it can take a long time. And so the feedback takes a very long time. And in the real world, in these problems, we have many feedback loops. So there may be a hundred or a thousand of them. Not all of them are even known or understood. And many of them take hours, days, months, or even years before they have an impact. And climate control, we want to do, you know, worry about the climate changes. Some of the things that we must do will take 10 years before the impact is felt. And that's very difficult to, for people to do. Because they feel they've worked hard and they've done everything they've been told and there's no change. So they stop doing it. So that's another big problem and that's where an educational emotion movement is required. So, here's what I'm saying. We want to work on complex, real-world, socio-technical problems. We want to make use of expert knowledge and community-driven knowledge. But we want to be careful because we're dealing with large problems, and large problems often fail, they're difficult to understand, they're very complex, and they change over time. But we want to be very flexible, we want to know that we're often wrong, and therefore do it by iteration, testing, 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 <coughs> and continually modifying. And the designer, because of design skills of bringing together disparate disciplines, because of the focus upon people, because of trying to solve the underlying basic problem and not the symptoms, treating it as a system, and also knowing how to, how to do the theater, the test ideas, and knowing the importance of testing. Designers are a perfect group of people to help lead the effort. 21st century designers, I call it, so we don't confuse them with traditional craftspeople. We still need craftspeople. They make our lives better and more enjoyable. Again, that's really craft design. But I'm saying, just like every discipline, like engineering, has many, many different kinds of engineering inside of it. And even if you're an electrical engineer, it has many, many sub-disciplines of electrical engineering inside of it. All design is the same way. We need many different kinds of design. Now, here in India, because, as Lalita said, um, we discovered each other at UC San Diego, and that made me discover Adhar, and then pretty soon the India stack. And we always believe in the power of platforms to extend people's abilities. I mean, GPS is a platform which has changed farming, changed travel, map systems, all sorts of things. Uh, any of the computer operating systems we have. A good example is just take your cell phones, whether it's an Android or an Apple. Um, the power of a cell phone is that it's a platform. But the real power are all the apps that are inside. In fact, I almost never use my cell phone to talk on the phone. I, but I use the apps a tremendous amount. So the platforms are what are powerful. And that's what I'm impressed with is happening here in India. Some of the powerful platforms that are being so, we're not sure what problem we want to work on, but we are going to try, well, at UC San Diego we've developed a um, program that we're calling Earth 2.0. What we want to do is attack the kinds of problems I've been talking about 
across the world. One of them we will do in the United States. One we are planning to do in Africa or in Hungary with the World Food Organization. One we would like to do here in India and in Bangladesh. And I'd like to do that same problem here and also in San Diego because the two places will have similar problems but they will be different. And it's very important because we can't just have a solution that's relevant to one culture. It has to be relevant to many different cultures. And it's, by the way, even in Bangalore, we have many different cultures. We have different levels of education, social economic classes, and also different needs. But this will be true throughout the world. So it's really important not to do one project, we do multiple projects, so we can try to learn the general rules, but then not to fall for the tyranny of experts, to realize these general rules can't just be given someplace else. They have to be tailored to the people who live there. But the best people who do the tailoring are the people who live there. So that's my journey and desire of where we are today and why I'm in India. Thank you. existing product, uh, what is the right process to start the UX because like we don't have any benchmark or uh, some kind of data of the new product. So I teach a method that's called human centered design that <clears throat> is an excellent method. Innovative products fail. Incremental products almost always succeed. I've always. 
is almost the most brand new thing is clear. I just remember that when you're really telling me. Really um, and but let me, even the ones that succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Even the ones that succeed. <coughs> even the ones that succeed. <laughs> even the ones that succeed may take ten years to become successful. When I joined Apple, they were about to release the product that I said, wow, that's going to change the world. And they released it, and it failed. <laughs> and I did a second version, and it failed. <laughs> and they did a third version and it failed and Apple said don't worry we're not going to build it anymore <laughs> but I was right it was a device that changed the world so much so that when I tell you about the device and I try to tell you what we did before it many of you won't know what I'm talking about but it took 15 years it was a camera that did not require film. You all know what film is? <laughs> <laughs> it was a study of a trip. It took the pictures, you had to send it off someplace, so you get them back a week later. And, um, but the problem was that the camera could only take eight pictures at once. <clears throat> that was not a problem because no, the film were all eight pictures. And um, there wasn't any screen, so if you took the picture, you didn't know what it looked like. But that wasn't the problem. There was no camera had a screen. The real problem was, what did you do with the picture once you took it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm a contractor, and there's a real problem here, and I'm going to take a picture and send it to my architect. Well, okay. So now you have to go find a telephone. And then you have to have this something called an acoustic coupler, two suction cups. You put the receipt, you put the headset onto it, you dial the number, and you send the picture at 300 boy. <laughs> and you don't know what boy you <laughs> It's 30 bytes a second. Not kilobytes, not megabytes. <laughs> and then when the person the other end got it, you didn't have to get printers. No color printers. So you see, it was too soon. So I have to answer your question. I said, good luck. <laughs> question in the back? Not working there. I can, yeah, I can speak without them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, firstly, uh, Don, I need to thank you because reading what you have written made me believe that I could be a designer without a design education. So thanks for that. Um, now, wait. <laughs> I have a design education. I taught myself. Which took a long time. So it's not important. Any work you do, you need to understand the piece. You should learn it by yourself. So continue. <laughs> um, I remember this um, this part from your book, The Design of Everyday Things, that has stayed with me over the years, which is what question do you ask? Uh, when you when you approach a design problem, do you say, I want to design a chair? Or do you say, I want to design something people can sit on? And that generates a whole different sort of perspective. And I keep, I keep thinking about, um, with a lot of these complex problems that you were talking about today, what is the way to ask the right question? Why are you asking the question? <laughs> And now as, as an aside, <clears throat> I asked him why for two reasons. One, to see if I can get the underlying reason behind that. And second, as an illustration of how I answered his question. 
when I ask to solve a problem, I always say, why is that a problem? And he's right, you want, you want me to resign or you share, well, why do you need to share? And et cetera, et cetera, you know. So we thought, well, maybe I just want some place for people to sit. Well, why should they sit? Why, why do you need a sitting place? Et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and, and ask him why. The Japanese call it the five whys. When you have an issue, you're supposed to ask why. And when you get the answer, ask why. You don't really have to ask five. You don't really have to ask five times. But that gives you the spirit. You keep going until you sort of reach the bottom. Or not so much the bottom, but a place where you can actually do something. <laughs> Okay. Well, I guess you you would answer this earlier. It's the way we study. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I try to explain to people is, is I understand their behavior. I understand your behavior better than you do, because we we as we don't really know why we do what we do. A lot of it's subconscious, subconscious biases, or the subconscious processing. And many of us know how many times have you decided you're going to buy something expensive, a car, or maybe clothes, or maybe a new cell phone, or automobile, or said that, automobile, or whatever. Um, and you study it, and you decide exactly what you want, and you go to the store, and you buy something. <coughs> yeah. So, so when the person can't answer why, then what I try to do is look at the situations that they are interested in. So, okay, you want to design shares. Where will it be? And what are people doing? And what are the activity? And then I might go and watch the activity and watch what's doing and come up with an answer. We did this in the cancer uh, center in San Diego where every week, they, twice a week, they had this big meeting of all of the different specialties to review all of the cases and decide whether they had done the right prescription. And everybody hated the meeting. It was a waste of time. And even though they knew it was necessary. And so they asked if we could figure out a way of making it faster. And that's what we did. We, did. we went to the meeting many times and watched and understood and saw who was there and the different people and the different kinds of problems. And then we brought all the people together and had them write down on the pieces on the most powerful design tool ever invented. It's called post-it notes. <laughs> you write little statements and then you post them on the board and then you look at them and then you organize them and try to see what's there. In any event, we figured out what the real problem was when they couldn't. And the real problem was they shouldn't have that meeting. <laughs> but they needed to do the activities, but there were different four different activities they had going on in that meeting and they should separate them out. And not only that, but the end result is much more enjoyable and efficient than what they were doing. But the people there could never have seen it themselves. Okay, next question. Thank you. Question on this side. Hi. Um, it's all big picture coming from you. Um, it's really good. So my name is Akash, I'm trained as an international designer studying open studies. So the questions about Earth Point 2, it sounds pretty exciting. And I want to get a perspective of you. How are you going to approach this with the government where one of the countries, USA, which is kind of developed and India is developing, Africa being like still able to do, which is colonized countries. And when you are pitching a project to governments and when Paris agreements are made where it's the equal numbers are distributed to all countries which also kind of limits development and industrialization. When talking about climate change, how are you going to approach this in these two countries? Well, I, that, it's really simple to answer that one. How are we going to approach the companies? The countries. We are not. We're simply going to do it. So, um, we do need to get the permission of the people we're working with. 
and cons, but we need a permission not just because it's a proper thing to do, but if we're doing something for a local community, if they aren't part of it, and here was important, and actually, as I said earlier, you're giving us the ideas and doing the designs, it's not going to work, then we'd accept it. So it's the local community we really care about. Um, let me give you my approach to the educational system, which is a mess, in my opinion, in every country in the world. And what I would like to do, and Balatesh and I have started to talk about this, is ignore the educational institution, but provide compelling educational material that simply answers a lot of questions that people have and a lot of needs that people but we don't, we're not going to give grades, and we're not going to give, uh, you know, you know uh, certified, uh, accredited courses. So we bypass that system. So um, YouTube already does that. Or the uh, Khan Academy is really good at this. The Khan Academy was uh, written by an uh, Indian named Khan. Who, uh, he was a really good mathematician, and his kids kept asking him to help with answers, and then the friends of the kids, and then the friends of the friends of the kids, and he finally said, there must be an easier way than having me say the same thing over and over and over again, so he said, we made little videos, homemade videos, on little algebraic problems, and it soon expanded to other sites, and soon other people came in to help, and now it, it covers history and civics, and I'm not even sure what it covers anymore, it's bigger and bigger. And it's been very effective. And we want to do similar things like that. We, we just were talking to somebody who said, I had to explain the solar system to my parents in Hindi. And how do you do that? I don't even know what the words are that would help me explain it. And, but what we want to do would be, first of all, they will be, I don't know what they're going to be. My guess is a lot of videos. But I also think that you learn, you don't learn by the lectures. The current lecture I'm giving is excellent for motivating people or occasionally uh, hearing someone. But if you want to learn, you have to do it by doing it and by struggling and by having problems. But you're not going to struggle unless you really care. So what we need to do is give, give you a problem that you really care about and then ask you to work on it. And then when you struggle, you're going to learn on it. And ask when you really get stuck, that's when you're ready to hear a little lecture or read a little bit about principles and be told something. But you, it's horrible to give people principles first. You have no idea why you're learning them or what they're good for. When you get stuck, that's when you're done. So we have to figure out how to manage that. And I want to make it as hands-on as possible. Uh, that doesn't, so that may not always be delivering it over the internet, because the internet is well, it's visual and auditory. And, and another philosophy I have is if we give little lectures, no lecture is more than two or three minutes. And if you want to see it, there's a, a, a MOOC, a massive online open course, by a company called Udacity, one of the first ones. And I have a course there. You can, if you can find it, it's free. You can, get, you can look at it free. And it's got, it follows these principles. And we hope that they're kind of engaging and they're short. So, for example, here. Here's how, here's how one of them starts. Oh, you recorded. How come? It was coming at you. It was coming at you, but it was at you. It was catchable. It afforded catching. What does afford mean? Oh, it means that the principal throw it to me, you see? You lift it, you throw it. I, I can hide behind it. Um, I can stand things up on it. The actions that are, is possible is a function of me and the box of the environment. We call that forms. You learn my principle. Now, well, <laughs> yeah, well that's a constraint. I mean, so the hands are busy there. It's constraint. You can't catch it. Take out a tissue. How did you know how to do that? <laughs> You've done it before. So actually experience is very really important. The other thing is, I mean, if I said take out a tissue, what would you do? 
Well, but how would you know that? <laughs> because there's no holding. There's no, there's no, if you will, of course, there's a constraint. And, but because you've known this in the box of tissues, you know there's, it must be somewhere else. And here, I notice the tissue sticks out. And I can always simplify. So anyway, we, I, that's how I start, with a little game where we throw this box back and forth. And, and I, we also made sure there was something in it. And I said, shake it. Oh, there's something in it. Uh, how do you know? That was set up some mental model. But you see, we tried, I, this little video was just to introduce the two of us that were teaching the class. We also managed to introduce about three or four fundamental concepts along the way. But without, without letting you, you didn't realize, if I told you to read a chapter on affordance and constraints, and you would hate it. So we might want to try that. But we do it again. We're going to do it, just do it, because we think people will discover it and they will like it as, as they have the other kinds of educational material already available. So that's an issue for us too. There's so much already available. Why are we doing it? What is needed? So we would only do this when we figure out the real, method, the real need that is not yet fulfilled. Okay, we will. Uh Take more questions later, but we'll now switch to the chat that we're going to have. Oh, I didn't know we'd have a chat. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you bring my water? Water. So, Don, that was. Fascinating session. My name is Sharad, uh, Sharad Sharma. So a lot of echo. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, my name is Sharad, Sharad Sharma. Uh, you know, we want to use this segment to talk a little bit about India. Uh, we've, we've had the privilege uh, of having Don here since Sunday, Sunday morning. And uh, <clears throat> first I must tell you that what a, what a wonderful set of sessions these have been. Uh, you know... Uh, they have been good. Almost everything I said, he immediately disagreed with. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, is important. Because the disagreements came with much better depth and much better results than not. So, thank you. Yeah, but, but our disagreements are minor in form. For example, he believes that tyranny of experts is, uh, you know, uh, is true. We agree on that. Uh, because look, any field that you have, software engineers are able to do better than the experts. Software engineers learn more about taxi systems and the taxi guys can learn about software. So you have something like Uber and Ola. You have so I'm just kidding here. Just just <laughs> so we so so we our starting point is is very similar that disregard the experts, trust the software engineers. He says no, don't trust the software engineers, trust the designers. So uh, <laughs> you can be electrical engineer. Yeah, and, and, and he, he has the ability to say that because he is both an engineer and designer, and that makes it very complicated for us uh, uh, from that perspective. I trust the software. The software engineers do. <laughs> that's what they're good at. They're not good at understanding what a person is. And that's what they're designing. Who said that strongly? <laughs> yeah. This is what we heard many times during the week as well. And so he has this uh, wonderful ability to bring both human psychology and engineering together in a way which has been truly fascinating. So just to, you know, as we go through the conversation, by show of hands, how many of you are from the design community? All right, very large number. Yeah. How many of you regard yourself as product managers? Okay. As well, in some cases as well. Yeah, okay. And how many of you are, you know, from the tech side and don't call yourself product managers? Okay, sounds good. This, this is very helpful. So we'll try and moderate the conversation uh, in, in that way. So, so Don, uh, we were having a conversation yesterday about Design, the design course that uh, we used to do in CMU. And 
Is it wrong to that? You said that, well, I used to advocate a way of doing design, and I think I'm wrong. What did you mean by that? Well, since so many of your designers are <coughs> going to understand. I teach this method of human centered design, which I actually helped invent. <coughs> and it's in, those of you who have my book, it's been the last two chapters of the new version of the book. A new version is only six years old. Um, it's that the first thing you must do is understand the needs of the people you're designing. So we ask for a process of design research. You go out and you really watch and observe how people are doing things. And today there's even a discipline called design research, where especially trained people all often do that. It's kind of an applied anthropology. Uh, second, you then try to figure out, okay, let's, in fact, the London uh, Design Council does this, they call it double diamond. Here's what happens to you. Um, You start off, here's a, here's a problem you think you want to solve. And now what we do is we think about what really is the problem. And we think about all sorts of possibilities. And so we're examining a big wide space. I can't do <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and then you, you narrow it down to now I understand the problem. And now you do the same thing about what possible solutions are, and then you narrow it down. Solution, and then you then you are also iterating and testing and designing all along the way, and then you finally have a solution, and etc. Et et well, it turns out that it's a wonderful method. It's really great to teach. It makes good sense. Everybody understands it. It's easy to do that in the classroom. It is almost never done in industry. Have any of you have ever done design research before doing the product? So we, we do it, but we change it as as required. You change it as required. Well, the process is always ever changing, and all designers would apply the process as per their own uh, internal process as well. So as they, they learn, they internalize and they make their own process. So First even of if they all, teach it, well, that's different. There, there are many different ways of doing this, so that's okay. But my argument to you is that there's not time. Well, actually, I made a law, Norman's law. <laughs> the day the product team is assembled, it is over its budget and it's behind schedule. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're told that I've run off and study people in this state or in this community. Oh, no, we can't. We don't have time. And besides, we don't have the budget. And but you're right. That's what we should do. So next time, we'll do it right. We'll do that with the next time. And I began to realize that this, this is not the order. That this design research, new and understanding of the people and the process is important, but it has to be being done all the time. So that when the product team is assembled, you're ready. You say, oh yeah, we've been doing some studies on that. And usually you know what studies you do, because you, if you're in a company, you know what the products of the company are. If you're a design consultancy, then you may not. Then you may have to argue for it. Design research phase. And the second one is that, well, here's my, here's my normal story. The company decides to do this well. And they say, well, how much time do you need to do the design? And you say, six months. And they say, come on. <laughs> and so they give you two months. Okay? And uh, what happens is you go, they go, <coughs> And, um, and then after two weeks, uh, some level, some executive comes by and says, I want to see how what you're doing. <clears throat> well, you're just, you've gotten this far. You're in the first hump of that first diet. And uh, so what, what the executive sees is people running all around, and half the people are gone in some other place, and there's no accomplishment. What's going on here? We're trying to understand the problem. I told you the problem. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay, so but all right, I'll come back again and see how you do. He comes back in a month. Well, after another two weeks, which is a month. So, 
how are you doing? Half your time is already used up, so where are you? You think we understand the problem. <laughs> okay? If you really need a really forgiving product and a manager, a high level executive, to, to allow you to do that. And now, comes back another two weeks later and says, well, where are you? Well, we're experimenting with this solution that's you only have another two weeks, and three quarters gone. In fact, if they come back sometimes just even a few days before it's due, where are you? Well, we don't know. And what I try to tell management people to do this, have faith in your design department. But the one thing you must do, you must tell them, um, you have to stick to the schedule, and you have to stick to the budget. But what's really interesting and amazing in this process is that in those last few days, many of you may have experienced this, it comes together. And it comes together very rapidly. But actually, one reason it's so rapid is because of all that other time, it wasn't wasted. Understanding the problem in depth really allows you to do a lot in your head. And then understanding all the alternative solutions also helps. So it comes time to put it together as fast. But let me tell you, management doesn't like it. And it's the rare management that lets you do it. Does this resonate with anybody? Yeah, a number of you. So we have to change our methods. And there's a new method that I really like. It's, it's not so much new as I watch, I talk to you know, great designers, and I watch them. For that I watch what I do. And quite often, what do I do first? I do exactly what you shouldn't do. First thing I do is build something. Before I've done any research, before I've done the building, I want to build something. And today, that's official. It's called research through design. <clears throat> because if you build something, first of all, you build it so you fully get it thrown away. But when you build something, you give it to people to try. You learn so much. You're learning a lot because you're forcing them not to tell you something, but to actually act. And by watching their action and so on, and also seeing where what you feel doesn't do it for them, not ah, a You learn it much faster. So I really am using the whole design methods that we use. The most of the principles are the same. And the four principles I recited about solve the right problem, focus upon the people, uh, utilize as part of the system, and finally, that you iterate, those are so important, but they can be done in any order. That's what I mean. Long answer. Thanks, Mike. So, anecdotally, I'm a graduate of the Stanford High School. First thing they do when you get there is they give you some money and say, build something. They done it for 30 years. And uh, it's interesting. Um, both of them have the same underlying principle, which is as designers, we don't know. And we have to figure out what we're from. We don't know. So one question switching to India. Um, you gave this example of this beautiful vase made of uh, paper. And there are two things interesting in that meeting. One was, it was a reading of the house who had learned from YouTube and Twitter. I was confused about which one it was. The, 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 the husband was very excited by it, but the lady <laughs> uh, it was He was very proud of it. Um, and they were selling it on Facebook and so on. And uh, she had worked on this for about a month. Uh, two hours a day, and she was selling it for 2500 and she was very excited that she was getting 2500 And we all know that it is worth far more than that. And so there is an arbitrage problem, which we are here to solve. Um, now, you, in, in the same trip, you also saw a, you know, iron smith making sickle smiths in their hands, and several things being done with, uh, in, a, in a very old-fashioned way. And you said, this is not going to scale, this is not going to solve problems of India. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, India has many problems. Uh, as an outsider, I don't like to. Uh, I don't want to be perceived as an outsider coming in and pointing out India's problems. Except I will point out that 
I believe that every single problem I have seen in India, I have seen in the United States also. Uh, the numbers are exactly. But uh, educational level, uh, a lot of uh, illiterate people. Uh, conversation is, later, but uh, not the same level of living. Um, they do not have running water inside the home, or do not have uh, toilets inside the home, or sanitary. And, um, and I, so I saw. When I was in Amulad, I saw a lot of craft work that was being done. And they're very proud of craft work and how they train it. And I think it's beautiful and wonderful, but I do not see that it's going to propel the entire nation. And with the last year sitting on the floor, uh, making a sieve, not, not quite with bare hands, but um, simple tools, hammer. And, um, and and wood fire off the corner. They're electrically powered bellows. So that was the only modern thing that you would hold electrically powered bellows. Um, it's wonderful, and I'm sure it uh, will find this. But one question I say, why are the farmers still cutting with a hand sis? It just doesn't feel right. And, Well, you're not, I consider this audience is not represent the farming community, or for that matter, the people who make a living in the community. But it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have, but it's good to maintain it in small amounts if they want to. But again, it's not how you build the nation. The nation, most nations are built through education. And I won't describe the education content or format. Education, which is allowed you how you learn and build from what happened in the past and from the knowledge of others. And that's the major feature of education. And the best way of transmitting knowledge to date has been uh, writing, which is why you must be literate. To cook up people with film and video, because that actually gives you much more. Video is a good way of explaining how things work, which you see them in the world. And with video animation, you can actually show you inside the world. And that's very powerful. That's what I'm telling you. Also, we spend a lot of time talking about these societal problems. You know, how to solve and uh, you know, these various approaches that are there. So, what stands out for you? you know, what are some of your takeaways and observations you know, that uh, you like to kind of <coughs> Uh, think a lot more about once you're back and you know what's kind of appealed to you and what seems to be a blind alley uh, you know has been before. Well, I think that the in healthcare I saw a very primitive healthcare uh, environment. Actually when I was in India twenty years ago I saw even more food than healthcare. We had a, I was working at Apple at the time and we had a project. I don't even know where it was. Um, it was in the middle of the country in the many, many, maybe many of you have ever been. And the, uh, the hospital we went to was a one room building. It did not have running water, did not have electricity, uh, and it uh, would take care of the sick and injured. But I was also saw one of the most advanced and sophisticated. Hospital system that I've ever been to, I've been to many, many hospitals. And with one of the best electronic medical record systems, it's still under development, but I'm incredibly impressed with it. I thought it was better than any electronic medical system I've ever seen. And I've been involved in a three year study of electronic medical systems where we try to find the very best ones in the United States. And this was better than any of them. And, um, so it's really the country of the street. We also went to the education, looked at some government school teaching. And uh, you have institutions, IIT, for example, that are well known and famous for the quality of education. But here we could not see that there was any education going. But the students stood, out, stood outside and they recited a prayer. That Seemed to go on forever, for five minutes, or longer. Twenty-five minutes. 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 Twenty-five minutes.
25 minutes, which they had memorized. And so your comment to that was, gee, that's a lot of memorization. Too bad it wasn't some useful educational material they had at least memorized. Um, and we did not see any education taking part in school. We tried. And so that, that's bothersome. So, um, by the way, the, the remarkable hospital God is talking about is Narendra uh, Dayalaya. He spent four hours with Dr. Devishan. It's hard not to be blown away by him. See what he's all done. Um, so, following up on what Sharad asked, I'm going to ask a direct question now that you had enough time to work out with Sharad. Uh, you saw the entire India stack um, that he's been the Sutra Dhar for. Um, I just want to clarify, did we bought it? Let me ask you that. In a good way. Yeah. Yeah, I recognize it. As I explained earlier, <coughs> I, my undergraduate institution was MIT, United States. So, the way you argue with me and disagree with me, that's what I like. That's how I grew up. I don't call it what it is. Um, the key coast was worse. The key coast was my president in transfer. We went to a meeting, actually, with Tamil on that Earth 2.0, and Pradeep was one of his teachers. And what Pradeep did was yell at us. Very distinguished president of the university yelling at us. And my response? He was right. It was our fault. We didn't prepare properly for the So I don't mind being you know, that or being, as I said as I said before, if anyone's gonna, I, if I'm wrong, I would know. So. But anyway, uh, now I forgot the question. <laughs> 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 yes, time. To my India stack is an outrageous, ambitious attempt to bring India to the digital age. And it's outrageous because of the population of 1.3 billion people. And some of the requirements of the ESAC go against normal culture and against the existing culture and against a whole bunch of existing practices. And if they're disenfranchised the middlemen, a lot of people will make profits off today's inefficiencies. But I think there's, I, I simply wish we had it. I think it's really powerful and can really enable a large number of really valuable services at much reduced prices, with much better efficiency. And efficiency, sometimes efficiency comes at a loss of um, the people who are involved. Here's a case where I think the efficiency improves human interaction, improves human case. But it's much more complex. I knew it was going to be complex, but now that I've heard more and more of the story and the pieces of the different parts coming together is even more complex than I thought it would be. And it certainly involves policy, it involves you know, a whole bunch of complex interactions. And any time you have a system this big, it's subject to misuse and corruption. And there's a lot of concern that our heart is not going to be beat to the police state or the government, <coughs> that all the citizens involved and so on. And that's a danger. And I can't be a lawyer, but it's a real danger. It will lead to corruption and people faking the system. Yes, they will. But I do recognize that, first of all, things were pretty bad before our car, and I've never seen a good study, which I'd love to see. Is look at the numbers before our car, look at the numbers afterwards, and see is there a substantial improvement. And second, um, we may have to wait because that part is just barely introduced and the, the applications that we built on top of it are just starting to come out. And I'm just worried about the size. This is the size. But I think it's ambitious and wonderful and powerful. Well, as we talked a lot about 
system design, ecosystem design, or playground design, kind of use some of these interchangeably. One common theme that you seem to keep coming back is that how do we build systems that create these, <coughs> that serve the role of being a trust catalyst, so that this collaboration, cooperation, co-creation amongst various parties can be accelerated. Now in some sense, design has played a big role in creating trust. My, my favorite example is Airbnb right now. A culture where stranger is danger, people now let in a stranger to spend the night, you know, in one of the rooms of the house. And a lot of that can be attributed to thoughtful design, right? And and building systems that leverage it. Any any thoughts that you have, you know, given the discussions that we've had that would accelerate India's movement from a low trust society to a more trusting kind of a society? I think that most of the principles that are being trust are being built into the system. They have to be open. They have to be that people can, can see, anybody can look inside basically and see how it's working. Uh, and the systems are open so that anybody can also use them if they wish. And that there's good feedback. Uh, and there should be a mechanism for, uh, if you have a complaint or a problem, there should be a way of working with it. Um, as we discussed earlier in our meetings, um, the ride sharing systems have developed some clever ways of doing trust. And one of them is that when you call a ride service, well, at first people were afraid to call a random automobile driver, they were the car to drive. And the drivers were frightened too, they didn't know what kind of passengers they might get. But what we now what they developed was this clever rating scheme that when you finish with your ride, you rate the driver and the ride. You may not realize it, but the driver rates you. And so that's a dual system which allows the drivers to trust the passengers and the passengers to trust the drivers. And um, that's very clever. And it's a bit like a thumbs up scheme or a, a likes in social networks. Uh, those can be gained in this one is more difficult. Uh, but it's, um, so that's another way to use, to use for feedback, and especially the openness. I think it's the openness, and we talked a little bit about the need for law, that legal systems, if they're applied fairly and openly, that is another way of instilling trust. So, let me switch topics to another topic that is a hard discussion topic in the technology and technology policy circles. Two related topics. One is about this thing called data localization. And the other that people often discuss is uh, break fence in India economically so that local companies and local digital corporations have a chance to survive and thrive. Um, in the elevator now, uh, we were discussing about data localization with Edmund Moyes. I described that it is about keeping the data of Indian residents in, inside the boundaries of India for two or three reasons. And you turn to me and almost physically ask me why is this even pretty big. Um, and there is a cultural thing where we are very afraid of almost saying that, you know, uh, we need to take care of India, paraphrasing Trump for it. Um, and what would you say to that kind of sentiment where, you know, the intellectual elite in India are almost afraid to say, you know, almost afraid to do anything other than this egalitarian free economic model where we have complete borders open. What would you say to that, you know, at right now? Well, it's back to trust. I don't trust the rest of the world. I especially don't trust the big corporations. Corporations, I mind you, are larger than most companies. And often have more power. Most countries. Most countries. Most countries. Most countries. Most countries. Most countries. Most countries.
often hear. And thank you, Max, for those speakers.